going to ask uh, Janice now to come and lead us in prayer. So Janice, could you come and lead us the Son of Grace? Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we have so much to thank you for this morning. We thank you that we're well enough to be here and that we have the promise that you will never leave us. Sometimes life brings its ups and downs, but you are a faithful God who is with us constantly and helps us through life's difficulties. We have freedom, security, friends and family, and food on our table. We think of those who are struggling at the moment those who have lost loved ones and are grieving, those who are sick, and those whose age and circumstances prevent them from joining with us. We think of the areas of the world where there are wars, famine, persecution, and insecurity. We pray for those who are trying to bring help and support to people who are displaced and living in fear. In these difficult and uncertain days, we thank you that we have amazing promises in your word which assure us of your continued love and <coughs> forgiveness. We pray for those organisations which are spreading this wonderful news to people who are indifferent to the things of God. We pray for your help as we seek to be a blessing to others ourselves. Father, we think of the year ahead, which is full of unknowns, and ask that you would lead and guide us as a church and as individuals to do the things which are in accordance with your will. We have a members meeting this week and pray that you will be with us and help us to make right decisions which are in accordance with your will and purpose. We pray for young people today some of whom have never heard the good news of your love for them and that you have a plan for their life. We pray for Christian teachers and others who go into schools and tell the youngsters <coughs> about you and how they can know your forgiveness and love for their lives. We thank you for the children gathered here this morning and pray your blessing on each of them. Lord, we pray for open hearts to receive what you have to say to us. And later, as we're taking communion, that you would help us understand in a new way what you did for us and the extent of your great love for us. We give you praise, Father, and commit ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, Amen. <coughs> And a happy new year to everybody, if I haven't said it to you already. I'm not sure when you stop saying that. There's got to be a cut-off point, hasn't there? Now. Come on. Are you upside down? Yeah, there's a seat there. When I was a little girl, my family, we were very blessed because we lived with my granddad. Um... And he was, he, he was an amazing man, really, because he lived through two world wars, which is amazing when you think about it. Like lots of people did, but it was amazing, really. And he was full of words of wisdom, such as, Lang may ye lumreek. <laughs> now, I don't know why he used to say that, because he wasn't Scottish. In fact, his family were Irish, so your guess is as good as mine. Does anybody know what he means? L Long may your chimney smoke. It means, I hope you've got enough to have a happy life, basically. I should ask David, because his mum was Scottish, he'd, he'd know. And then the other thing he always used to say to us, because nine people lived down in our house, right? He used to say to us, you'll catch a cold if you go out with wet hair. Well, you never did. You never did, but he used to say it. One thing he used to say to us if we were naughty is he, uh, he'd send us to the Kirkdale homes with our ears tied back. Now, I don't know why, but that used to say it. I never used to... I never used to be naughty enough for it to happen. Um, but his favourite one every year, and we always used to wait for it, he used to say, and he used to say it in this voice, 
dark days before Christmas. Well, he was right, wasn't he? He was always right. And he always said it. And in fact, a couple of weeks ago, I was driving along in the car going to work and I found myself saying it. I thought, there's something wrong with you. Um, <laughs> but he was right, because just before Christmas is the shortest day of the year when we have the least daylight in this country. Some countries at this time of year had no daylight at all. So he was right. But since then, the days are getting slightly longer every day. And in a few weeks' time, it'll be noticeable. Now, over Christmas week, it was indeed very dark. And uh, going to work was quite miserable, especially as it was absolutely pouring with rain, which made it feel even darker. So I, like many people, got up in the dark. I went to work in the dark. I drove through Liverpool in the dark. I got to my first visit in the dark, and the person I was visiting opened the door in their PJs, looking all blurry-eyed, and was probably wishing they were still in bed. And it's a little bit hard going. And for some people, it's a big problem, these very short daylight days. Now, when I set off for work and I'm driving around, I need some of these to help me. Can I have the first picture, please? What is it? Headlights. Headlights, yeah. So, how do headlights help me? Yeah, I can see the way ahead, can't I? Especially on the motorway where there's no lights. Um, what else does it do? It tells them the <laughs> yeah, yeah. And if another car's coming the other way, what does it tell me? I can see them, can't I? I know there's a car coming on the wrong side of the road. If they're on the motorway, they're definitely on the wrong side of the road. So you know there's a car coming the other way, don't you? So, can I have the next picture, please? What's this a picture of? It's a street, isn't it? What do they do? Yeah. What well, if you look ahead and you see street lights? What does it do? Anybody else? So it'll mark the route for you, because you can see them all ahead of you, can't you? So it marks the route. You see, you feel safer because you can see, and, and, and it's not dark anymore. And you can see dangers as well. You can see good things, but you can see dangers as well. So can we have the next picture, please? So what's this? A traffic light. Okay, it's a traffic light. I'm going to ask the adults this. What's that traffic light telling you now? <laughs> Get ready to go. Did you see that quiz on the telly where... The, the question was about the light sequence and nobody got it right. They were all car drivers. <laughs> so we're going to test you now. So red, what does red mean? Stop. Stop. What does red and amber mean? Get ready. Get ready to what? Go. Go. Uh, green? Go. Amber? Get ready to stop. It doesn't mean speed up and get through them at all costs. <laughs> it means get ready to slow down and stop. And what does red mean? That's right. So the traffic lights are there for what purpose? <laughs> right, to guide us, to keep us safe. And it's not just the people who are driving, is it? It's everybody who uses the roads. So it's the pedestrians, people on bikes, everybody. And we all need to obey those lights to look after each other and ourselves and to stop people getting hurt. So can we have the last one, please? Christmas lights. Now, I hope you've got them all down, because yesterday was 12th night, and my granddad used to say at midnight on 12th night, if they're not down, you're going to have a year's bad luck. <laughs> so what do you do if you forget to take them down? Leave them up for the whole year? I don't know. Yeah. So, but they're beautiful, aren't they? And they, the way they twinkle in the darkness makes you feel all cosy and warm. At Christmas, you feel excited, don't you? All at the same time. Now, I'm sure you're wondering what on earth she's rabbiting on about. That's fine. Uh, well, Christians often refer to Jesus as being the light of the world. So today we're looking at a, um, a chapter from Ephesians. And in Sunday school, we're going to particularly be looking at living in the light and what that means for us. <clears throat> Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. And live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. 
but among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk or coarse joking which are out <coughs> of place but rather thanksgiving. For, for of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore do not be partners with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, wake up sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, <clears throat> always giving thanks to God the Father for everything, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Excellent. Okay, good. So, uh, let's just pray before we look at God's Word together, shall we? And uh, pick up where we left off from before Christmas in our look at this letter to the Ephesians. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would be with us now as we open your words, open our hearts and open our minds, and lift our spirits, Lord, and help us to tune into what you have to say to us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, like I say, picking up from where we left off before Christmas, quite a while ago now, more than a month ago, really. Um, and remember, we look, we've been looking at this letter since last summer. And what we, we, we've learned so far, without going into all the details of it, is that Ephesians are split into two parts. The first part is what, as Paul talks first, chapters one to three, talks about what God has done for us. And Paul goes into who we are in Christ, what he's done for us, how he's, lived, how he's loved us in his grace and mercy and saved us and brought us from darkness to light and it's all been of him so these are the in, uh, indicative things these are things that god has done and out of that then in a way we serve god isn't because we decide what we want to do but out of those things because of what god has done for us we then serve him and chapters four to six are really chapters about um in, not the second part of the letter really are all about how then we respond to what God has done for us, what, how we should live, in the, uh, how, what it should look like to be a Christian, to be a church, actually, as well. Because Paul is writing here to not just individual people, but mainly to churches. This is how you should behave as a church, but also as an individual as well, of course. So how we should now live, and these are the imperatives, and we've said about gospel grammar, remember all that time ago? That we have to get it right. We know what God has done. And because of what God has done in us. We are able to live for him. We can't do that without what God has done with us. For us. Uh, taking effect in our lives. Okay. And that's how it works together. Now the last couple of times before we. As it were changed and looked at Christmas things. We looked at our new wardrobe. We started to look at what we should look like. As, as Christians as a church. Uh, putting off the old and putting on the new bit like new year isn't it putting off the old and putting on the new new year's resolutions but here it's much more important it's a lifestyle it's the way we live it's who we are we live out who we are in christ and uh, that's what we looked at didn't we also it, it worked itself out this in how we relate to one another a new relationship within the church keeping the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace 
looking out for one another, serving one another, uh, speaking to one another and, and encouraging one another and all of those different things we looked at last time. Okay, so that's where we've got up to. And if you want to know more about those, they're all videos on our website and on our YouTube page. You can look back on the on the list of things and uh, it's good sometimes to catch up with it all again and to, if you've fallen behind or you've not, you've missed a few, they're all on there, okay? All 10 episodes so far. And this morning we were on episode 11. Didn't think it was that many, did we? But I was surprised when I saw the number. And uh, chapter five, living in the light. That's what Mandy said to the kids. And what we're looking at, it's about being holy. To be a Christian, to be a church, we should set, be set apart and we should be a standout people in a corrupt world. We should look different, sound different, be different in every way, behave differently. Our attitudes and values are going to be different to those in the world. We should not be surprised when this happens. It's going to be different in every, almost every aspect. And we always think that our world is worse than it's ever been before. But it was just the same in Ephesus. They worshipped a goddess, the majority of the people there, goddess Diana, uh, were sexual impropriety. And in every form was it not only allowed, but encouraged, positively encouraged. Abusive situations that we would call them today were just the norm. That's how it happened. And everything came out of that. And so... If we think our society is bad, it was probably, in many ways, even worse then. And uh, into this, Paul writes this letter to this church. You're going to have to be different because that's what society's like. And this is what you are like as children of light, not in the darkness, but in the light. OK, and that's what we're looking at this morning. What does this look like for us? And I'll try and be as brief as I can. The first two verses talk about the love of of God's family living in the light means living in the love of being a part of God's family following Jesus example we should be lives our lives should be characterized by love it's not rocket science this is it this is base Christianity number one 101 isn't it um, the love of God's family the, the verses we read follow God's example therefore as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love just as Christ and it's following him we are to imitate him uh, we are to live out the family likeness we are part of his family and so we should live like him and God is making us more like that because of what he's done in us remember we are able to live like this just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrance offering and a sacrifice to God so when people look at us as Christians, they should see people. And as a church, they should see the love that we have for each other. And it should mirror the love that Christ has for us. That's a tall order, isn't it? But that's what we're aiming for. God's standards, as we'll see in these passages, are the highest. The bar is very high. So it should be. Because that's who God is. And so we're to be imitators of him. We're to live like we belong to his family. They should recognise a family resemblance in us. Our friends should do it. Our family should do it. Uh, so in our homes, and especially, is where we should see it. But also our church should be like that. People in Rain Hill should know Trinity Church and the Christians here as being different. Not in a bad way or a weird way, but in a way that says, look at the love that these people have for each other. When people come in from outside, they should sense that. It should be the first thing that they see. What did Jesus pray for us when he prayed in John 17? And we, we read that at the end of John's Gospel, don't we? As he prays to his father in John's wonderful Jesus high priestly prayer is in this chapter. And the thing he prays for most of all, that we might be one as, that, that they might be one as we are one. In other words, that we might be united. What Paul's saying here, unity in the spirit, in the bond of peace. And that the people outside would know that they are Christians because of the love that they have for each other. It's not rocket science, as I said. It's basic, isn't it, really? And look at the love that we have to emulate, that we have to uh, uh, copy, if you like. Jesus, who gave himself up for us. Now, the one Greek word that we all kind of know from the Bible is agape, agapeo, isn't it? Uh, we used to have, in, our, in the 70s and 80s in our church that I grew up in, agapeo feasts, all right? Love feasts where, and it's a bit like what we have on Sundays at the end of the month, where people bring stuff and we share it together. 
It's giving ourselves up. It's saying, I'm going to spend a bit of time making a bit of food. I'm bringing it along and I'm going to give it up for people. I'm not going to eat it all myself. I'm going to give it to people. Sometimes we're glad to get rid of it, to be honest. But no, that, that's not what I'm saying. No, that's not what it is. Uh, but no, we, we give it up for people. And, and, and Christian love, Christian love is different because it doesn't count the cost. Christian love is different because like Jesus, it's ready to go all the way. Now that's where the challenge comes, isn't it? Because in many ways it's quite easy to make a bit of food and give it away. Or give a bit of our time away, or a bit of this, or a bit of that, or a bit of the other. But here, our attitude, and, and all of this chapter really is about our attitude, rather than the specific things, as we'll see in a moment, that Paul tells them about. He's relating this to them in their church, but it can, our issues might be different, and they are different in many ways. But this principle of giving ourselves up is what Christ did for us. Therefore, we should be doing that for another. Reminding ourselves again, this, as I say, we're going to celebrate this Lord's Supper. And what greater example do we need of a saviour who came and gave himself up even unto death on a cross? That's the example. How much are we prepared to give ourselves up for one another as a fragrant offering? And we often think, some people think that Jesus example uh, Jesus came just to be an example for us we need to follow his example and we've already said that's not what Jesus came to do primarily his primary work was the work of the cross to deal with our sins so that we could live like this okay but in in in, this, in the way that Jesus is our example the one part of his example that he wanted us to follow was this given of ourselves to love like him Love one another as I have loved you. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind and your strength. But he doesn't stop there. Love your neighbour as yourself. Two greatest commandments. It's, it's not hard to see what Jesus really wanted us to understand. How we work this out. And our first, the primary characteristic of every Christian should be, look how they love other people. Look at their generous, great, big, loving heart that gives themselves up for us, puts themselves out, that budges up and makes room for people all the time. It should be our characteristic because that's what Jesus is like with us. And Paul talks about it in Romans in a slightly different way. It's part of our worship. Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, to give ourselves, lay our lives down as living sacrifices. It's the same principle. It's giving ourselves up. Jesus said about discipleship, didn't he? John, uh, uh, Luke 14, I think verse 6, or something like that anyway. I, I don't quote me on that. Luke 14, definitely. And he talks about if a person will not give up everything they have, they can't be my disciple. It's giving ourselves up. The problem is, the, and this, here's where we conflict with the world, because the world is completely opposite. Don't give everything. You're entitled to everything that you have, and actually you should have more. The world's been unfair to you. You, need, you deserve this, you deserve that, you deserve the other. It's all about you. And Christianity is totally different to that. It turns it upside down. Jesus came not to be served in that way, but to serve. So how's it going? How much are we prepared to give ourselves up? Later, in the next, next week actually, we're going to look at this, pro, this, not problematic, but this passage that everybody wants to get to, where we talk about husbands and wives and how we live in our homes and things like that. Can't wait for Will to get onto that. Let's see how he messes that up next week or whatever. Or how we deal with that. How are we going to come bruised and battered or is it going to be okay? These are, this is good news. This is God's good design. No one's going to apologise for it. But the, the centrepiece of it all is... Giving ourselves up for one another. Submit to one, to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's what that verse means. We tend to think of submission like a wrestling match. And it's not. Submission means I'm forcing somebody to submit to my power and control. But submission is actually the power is in the hand of the submissee, if you like. The one who is choosing to submit. I will choose who I submit to. I'm going to get on to next week's thing in a minute, but... But, that's, but in terms of how we give ourselves up for each other, we get the choice. We don't have to do that. But if we want to live like Jesus, that's what we'll choose to do every time. Just like he does with us. What a challenge that is. Because it sounds great, but it's not always that easy, is it? Because people don't make it easy for us to do that because we're sinful people. 
holy, living in the light of love, following the example of Jesus, giving ourselves up for each other. Point number one, done. All right. Living in the light means living in the love of God's family. This second one is a bit more is a bit more to it. Live, living in the light means living in the light of God's holiness. Verses three down to verse seventeen, and Paul lists a whole number of things that we shouldn't be doing, and it, they were characteristics of things that were happening in the Ephesian church amongst their people, and and the characteristics of most churches, to be honest, and most people. Uh, but they are things and what we tend to do when Paul or anyone else in the scripture starts writing about don't do this don't do that we focus on the thing and we dissect it and we try and find out what did he really mean by coarse language what did he really mean by this filthy talk what did he mean by all these other things and we spend hours on I'm not going to do that this morning you'll be glad to know because actually it's it's about our attitude it's about our heart it's about what leads us to do that in the first place whatever that may look like it's not good is it? But among you, uh, Paul says, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or greed because there are, these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. That's a strange thing to put at the end of that, isn't it? But we'll come to that in a second. Paul is not, and it's interesting here as well, Paul is not admonishing and telling off the culture, the world here. He's speaking to Christians in the church. Now that's surprising, isn't it? Among you lot, there should not be anything improper for God's holy people. Impurity, greed, sexual immorality, uh, obscenity, foolish talk, or ch coarse joking. Now we can, we can focus on them things and say, well, we've got them down, we don't do any of them, so we're fine. You see, that's the problem when we limit it to just those things. But Paul's addressing this to a church he knows, and he knows those things are going on there. So he's telling them that. These are evidences that their hearts aren't right, that they're not loving like the family of Jesus in that way. And we should be different. That's what the culture does do, and they don't mind those things. But even some people in the culture are better than people in the church as far as tolerating stuff like that. So what's it about? Is it just ticking boxes? Of course it's not. It's never about ticking the boxes. It, 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 oh, it never is. And we as people love to be able to tick boxes and say, yeah, well, I've done these things or I've not done them. I'm all right. But that's not what the Bible's ever about. God's not interested in ticking boxes. That's pharisaical. God's interested in our hearts and what the state of them is. And so basically what Paul is saying here is we must not adopt what the culture thinks is OK. And that's what was the culture was thinking was OK in Ephesus but what our culture thinks is okay today and the way it thinks and the way it lives we must not adopt that at all adopt the culture we are to be holy set apart and there's a difference between adopting and adapting to our culture okay because we need to adapt to it adoption of our culture means to become like them to just immerse ourselves in it and adopt it in everything that we do it becomes part of us that's not what God wants. But God does want us to adapt to the culture that we live in and recognise that we don't live in the days that we did 50 years ago or 100 years ago or in Bible times. It's different for us to most of them. So we adapt our message to be able to engage. So adopting is to become like them. Adapting is to engage with them. So let's get that right at the start. This is an anti-cultural rant a woke rant, an anti-woke rant from Paul here, or anything like that. It's nothing to do with that. And the danger is we can get caught up in stuff like that. We all can. But actually, our job is to expose the darkness, not by always just being negative and pointing it out, by living lights, lives of such bright, brilliant, Christian, God-centred, Christ-centred, worshipping light that it does always expose the darkness and it makes everything uncomfortable. It exposes the darkness in one another, it exposes the darkness in me, and it exposes the darkness in the culture around us too, because we just live like that. And we are what we say we are. We live what we say we live. We approve of, we live the, the, the things that we approve of, and we don't live the things we disapprove of. It's easy these days, isn't it? Because you can just hide behind a keyboard and type all these things. And Paul says, look, it, God's standards in this are, are, are perfect. Not even a hint of these things. Not even a hint. You don't, you're not trying to you know, sail as, as close to the edge as possible. You're, there's not even a hint. Don't let your mind or your heart drift into this stuff. 
at all. Because God's perfect. And he has high standards. High standards sexual, in our sexuality, sexually. High standards in our integrity. High standards in the things that we talk about, if you want to look at these things, particularly that Paul mentions. But in everything, God's standards are perfect. And we as Christians need to come into these things and recognise that we are not perfect, but our striving should be to be like he is. Be perfect as your heavenly part father is perfect. You can't be, so you need to come to the cross every single day. And live a life that glorifies him. And reject the culture and the world that we live in, in that sense. But adapt to it so that we can, we don't try to redeem it. What we're trying to do is to speak God's light into that culture. A lot of churches and a lot of people today talk about this. And there's a big discussion. You might not agree with me or you might. It's one of those kind of secondary things. But I don't think the church's job is to redeem our culture. Our church's job is just to proclaim the gospel and shine the light of the good news of Christ into our culture and leave them with the consequences of that they need to respond to that call them to respond in repentance but that's how we should live and we don't do that from a hypocritical point of view standing on our high horse and proclaiming what this is right we need to live lives that bear that out so people see our good works and glorify our father in heaven that's what it's all about for you were once darkness, Paul says, and now you're light in the Lord, so live as children of light. That light will expose the darkness. We don't need to go and look for battles. They'll be there. They'll find us everywhere we go. We will be different, a standout people. Don't think like the world. Don't walk, stand, or sit in the presence of the world. Remember Psalm 1? Don't walk. Blessed is the man who doesn't walk, doesn't stand, or doesn't sit in the ways of the world. We adapt to it, we don't adopt it. It's a matter of our heart. So the question this morning is, if you're really honest, where is your heart? How much of the world do you want? How much of the world are you striving after? How much is the world setting your goals and targets for 2024 in your family, in your own personal life and walk? And how much is God at the centre of them? I'm sure he'll be there somewhere because we're all good Christians. But how much has the world impinged on those plans? How, much, how worldly are our plans for this year? Whether it's as a church or as individuals. At the start of the year, it's a good point to think of these things, isn't it? How worldly do we want to be? Or how godly do we want to be? How holy, how set apart do we want to be? Is And the question is, this is where this phrase, but rather thanksgiving came in at the end of that little phrase when he's talking about all these negative things, instead of doing these things with the world, rather we should be thanksgiving. Why does that come in there? Because what Paul is saying is, is God enough for you? Have you given up giving thanks to him for everything that he's given you? Or is the world, you need the world as well? You need everything that the world has to offer. Is God enough for you this year? Will he be enough for you this year? Whatever he plans, whatever he sends, whatever he gives, the sun and rain of his providence, are you going to thank him anyway? Or are you waiting for the world to fulfil your needs and to have the things that you want? I'm preaching this to myself as much as it is to you. What a shocker when I started reading this. I've got to preach this to myself too. And it's hard, isn't it, as we start the, work, the year? It seems, doesn't it? Have we stopped thanking? Have we got distracted by the world? Don't be deceived, Paul says, verse 6. Don't be partners with it, verse 7. Be friends. Make friends in the world in order to win them to Christ and to show them the love of Christ. Don't shy away from the world. Don't be in the world, but not of the world, as Jesus says. That's what it means. So don't be partners with them. Don't join in with what the world's doing. In that sense. They're living in darkness. We adapt to the world rather than adopting it. You must love them. We must love the people in this world. We must not stand in judgment over them. There's only one judge, and who's that? It's God himself, and he's our judge too. And the only reason we escape is because of God's grace. One Chapters 1 to 3. And so we're like, as the old hymn writer says, one beggar teach, showing another beggar where to find the bread. That's how we should be when we approach the world. And Paul's message is live in the light. Because that will, um, what does that look like? Well, how do we live in the light? We find out what pleases God, verse 10. We find out what pleases the Lord. And that will be light filled. That will shame the darkness as it shines. As you live your life in the world, it will shame the darkness, Paul says. 
as well. It will expose and make it uncomfortable. Sometimes it might not seem welcomed by the world. Sometimes it might be vehemently opposed by the world. And we will be like a leper, kind of kicked out of whatever it might be. And we might feel we're on the outside of it. But this is the life that God's called us to live in, the light of his glory and grace. So we find out what pleases God, not what pleases the people in the world. And we live that, and that will be light-filled, and it will expose the darkness. And sometimes that will be uncomfortable. Are we up for that? Are we ready for that? In our own homes, in the church, outside. And so Paul goes on to talk about, he quotes this, this little quote here. Wake up, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. In other words... Don't be asleep. Don't sleepwalk into this. The danger is that we sleepwalk into compromise with the world, don't we? And we're not as holy. We sleepwalk into it. Believer or not believer, we just do. So he's saying, wake up and smell the impurity. Wake up and give your head a wobble. Switch the light on. And let's see it for what it really is. Before you approve of it. Adapt to the world. Don't adopt it. Verse 15 to 17 should be our memory verses. I think the kids might be thinking of these this morning when they go up there. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Find out what pleases God. These are good verses, aren't they? Good memory verses. Be very careful how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Be careful, be wise, be alert, and don't be a fool. Don't be a fool. Love of God's family we live in, the light of his holiness. And finally, we use the language when we're speaking to one another of God's spirit. To encourage one of the positive things, if you like. Don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Always give thanks to the God the Father for everything. There's thanksgivings in there again. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. These are the positives. Firstly, a bit of negative. Don't be drunk on wine. Obviously, this was a problem in this church. Drunken, debauched parties was one of the things that they were known for in Ephesus. So don't get drunk on that. That might be fun for a while, but it's not going to last, if it, as it were. It was a problem for them. Don't, in other words, what he's saying is it's not wine itself that's the problem, or alcohol per se. We don't have a chance to go into all of that this morning. But don't let it take control of you. I think there's some great verses. It's in Proverbs 23. Think of Psalm 23. Then go to the next book. And Proverbs 23, verse 29 to 35. If you want to know what it looks like to be drunk. All right. The Bible talks about it. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaints? Who has needless bruises? Who has bloodshot eyes? Those who linger over wine and who go to sample bowls of mixed wine. Don't gaze at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup and when it goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a snake and poisons like a viper. Your eyes will see strange sights and your mind will imagine confusing things. You will be like one sleeping in the high seas, lying on top of the rigging. They hit me, you will say, but it won't hurt. They beat me, but I don't feel it. And when I wake up, I'll wake up so I can find another drink. Do we know anything about that? That's why it's a problem, isn't it? Because we're out of control. We can smile. Instead, let's concentrate on this. Instead, be, be filled with the Spirit. So Paul wasn't here having a diatribe against drink. Okay, He was saying, you know, you know those parties you go to where you all get drunk and stuff like that and the church, you feel like you're missing out on it. Don't be drunk like that, but be filled with the Spirit. He says it in passing. Okay. Be filled with the Spirit. What does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? Well, again, we could have a whole series on that in one sense, but it's a contrast to the wine. Where's your heart? What is your heart filled with? What makes your heart merry? Which spirit is it? The one that corrupts and makes us see confusing things or the clarity of the light of God's Holy Spirit. Who's in control? 
And, uh, 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 Paul writes a similar letter to the Colossians. We have, we, if you read Colossians and Ephesians, there are a lot of very big similarities between the two. And in Colossians 3 and verse 16, where Paul says the same thing to them, he illuminates what it means and how we are filled with the Spirit. Let the message of Christ dwell amongst you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your heart. This is a being filled with the Spirit. It's a picture of sails being filled with the wind of God's Holy Spirit, blowing us along and directing us in our lives. That's the picture. Sometimes you see pictures of buckets and jars and all kinds of things and cups. It's not that. It's kind of the, the ongoing work of God's Holy Spirit that we cast our sails to the wind and we say, right, Lord, blow us along. Lead us, guide us, strengthen us, illuminate us, show us the way. Those lights that we were talking about before. And we are filled with the Spirit. How? Through the Word of God, it says. They always work together, Spirit and Word. Read it in the Scriptures, it's there. The Spirit will transform our hearts and make us into these people that we've been talking about this morning, living holy lives. But they do it through the truth of God's, He does it through the truth of God's Word. As we read God's Word given to us, as we listen to the words of Jesus, as we read the words of the prophets of Old Testament, as we read the letters that we have in the New Testament, and we allow the Holy Spirit to bring light into them, they will transform our hearts and they'll give us a firm place to stand and a road to walk on. And we will live lives that are different if we apply those to our lives. Our conversation will be affected. Our sec the way we think about sex and, and, and all of sexuality and things like that will be affected. Our language, the way we speak, will be affected to one another. All of our behaviour is changed as we're filled with the Spirit through God's Word. That's what it's all about. A desire for holiness will be given to us. A desire for the light. Hunger and thirsting after righteousness. Where does that come from? It's certainly not going to come from the world. But it does come from the Holy Spirit filling us through God's Word. Notice the Emmaus Road disciples. Remember them? Luke 24. How their hearts burnt within them. How did that happen? Jesus comes alongside. A, a picture of the Holy Spirit. The paraclete coming alongside us. And he walks along with them. And he exposes if you like the, them to the light of God's word. And he is a great teacher. Teaches them God's word. And their hearts burnt within them. Don't we all want a bit of that as we go through the year? So much so that they turned around. And their lives were completely transformed. That's what God does. Through his Holy Spirit. Produces an outpouring of joy. Singing, making melody in your heart, making music in your heart with thanksgiving and gratitude, a generous, thankful heart. We all need those. That's what makes us stand out in the world. You look at all the stuff that people talk about at the end of the... You know, we, we talk about thanksgiving and what we can give thanks for at the end of this world and we struggle to find anything because it's been such a hard year and we think of all these things. Is that how we are as Christians? Do we come to the end of last year and the beginning of this looking forward with hearts of gratitude to God and thanksgiving for all that he is to us and what he's got for us and the fact that we're in his hands and our future is with him and everything else that goes with that and all the stuff we've learnt about? That's what we do and it makes us sing. It makes us be grateful. There's music in our heart. We sing to him and we sing to one another. Isn't this great? Isn't this wonderful? And we sing to others, a desire for the light. There's a hymn, an old hymn, and it came to mind. Remember the hymn, we're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. Remember that one? That's a chorus. We're marching through Emmanuel's lines, quite old-fashioned in the words. But there's a bit, there's a couple of lines that it says, Let those refuse to think, sing who never knew the Lord. Psalmist says that when we become Christians, when he places our feet on the rock, he puts a new song in our hearts. What song are you singing now? What song are you going to sing through this year? Where's the joy going to come from? People who are living in darkness or are dead, well, they don't sing. They don't sing of the wonders of God and the glory of him. And they're not thankful to him. But you and I are different. And we should be. And the more we're thankful and the more we focus on the old hymn, count your blessings and naming them one by one, that's when we find the joy and we focus on him. So when the band strikes, you sing. So do I.
We just do it. Even if we don't know it, and even if the key's too high, and even if it's not a song we're familiar with, and even if it's not our favourite, we sing, folks, because these are truths of God. And we don't give it up. Never give it up. We live, as we finish this morning, in the love of God's family. Giving myself up for others. Sacrificially. How's that going? When was the last time you gave yourself up for somebody? Where's your generous heart? Where is it? We live in the light of God's holiness because of what he's done for us. Where is my heart? Am I adopting the world or am I adapting to it? What's driving my desires? Am I distinctive? Am I partners or friends with the world? What am I? What's important to me? Who am I trying to please? Am I finding out what pleases the Lord? Or am I wondering about pleasing the people who have nothing to do with him and are people in darkness? Am I using the language of the Spirit? Am I filled through the Word of God? Is my conversation seasoned with salt and helping other people? Is my conversation good when I'm talking about other people? Is my conversation upbuilding and encouraging? Are my thoughts that way? Is my heart that way? Am I, am I filled with the Spirit through the Word of God? How is my conversation? What's my singing like? And I don't mean whether it's tuneful. I just mean whether it's loud and full of joy of the Spirit. And we can do all of that because of this. We're coming to the table now. I'm just going to uh, sing for a moment as we prepare our hearts about the light of the world who stepped into our darkness. When we come to this table, how grateful are you that you're not uh, part of this world, not because of anything that you did, but because of what God has done and because of the way he's taken us and rescued us and made us alive in him. This is what we celebrate this morning. As we go into this year, we are different, not because we are hypocritical or we're more holier than thou, but we are different because God has made us that way. So let's celebrate it. Let's live it. Let's live in the light. Let's challenge each other. Let's rebuke and admonish one another with songs and hymns and spiritual song so that we can all be a great witness of light and love to this world. Amen.